Is everyone able to hear me? Yep. Morning. Great. Oh, hey, what's up, Tom? Okay. Um, well, I guess uh, there's not necessarily anything to wait for. I heard that the recording has started, so uh, let's go ahead and get to it. But, um, I'm assuming that you're all here because you're expecting the uh, Chainlink Plus Remix workshop for the virtual hackathon that we're hosting, um, so I'm here to give that. My name is Dan. I'm a developer advocate for Chainlink. I started about six weeks ago, um, and maybe one of the things that you will notice uh, is that I'm not some kind of whiz-bang Solidity developer, uh, and so I actually hope that that will help you all uh, see that these technologies that we're using are not uh, you know, super hard to grasp and that really anyone who's kind of curious and had some experience with these kinds of things uh, should be able to pick them up very easily. Um, I do want to make sure that this is kind of an active workshop and that you're all enjoying it and getting out of it what you'd like. So um, please feel free to, you know, just kind of ask any questions that you have. Um, if I kind of push your question off for a moment. Uh, please don't take that personally, you know, just doing my job to make sure that things are running smoothly. Um, but don't be afraid to kind of poke and prod at me if you think that I may have forgotten your question and, and not gotten to it or something. Um, so with that, I think what I'm going to do now is go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and share my entire desktop for y'all. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yeah, we we can see it. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let's see. Is there like, let me post this into the chat here. Um, okay, so this link is in the chat there for everyone uh, on the the, um, the Zoom right now, and we'll make sure to get the this link distributed out and everything like that. So uh, don't don't feel like you have to follow along with me. Uh, I'd like for you to just kind of watch what I'm doing, and then uh, hopefully you'll take some time afterwards to do this on your own, and it will all seem very familiar to you because we've we've already done it together. Um, so basically, as the title states, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of uh, use this uh, tool that's really awesome. It's called the Remix Ethereum IDE to build the Chainlink smart contract and interact with it. And then we're even going to push this out to GitHub. And kind of my whole idea here is that I, I want you to see what it would be like to potentially uh, start a project from scratch, do a little bit of development on it and then push it out to GitHub, which is the way that you would be submitting it as your, your hackathon submission. Um, so as you can see, there are some kind of uh, things that I expect you to have on your machine before getting started. Uh, Git is a very common tool for working with code and, and managing changes to it. Uh, Node is an application that's used to run JavaScript on your computer, and NPM is an application that comes bundled with Node and just helps you uh, get different packages and stuff like that. In this case, it's uh, what we're going to use to get the Remix D package, which is how we're going to help us work with the Remix IDE. Uh, we're also going to need a text editor uh, for local development, uh, and also just to kind of help us install some of these dependencies and stuff like that. I use Visual Studio Code. It's a great uh, it's a great piece of software, and a lot of you are probably already familiar with it. Uh, obviously, everything's on the web now, so you're going to have to have a web browser. I'm using Brave, which is uh, a lot like Chrome, so if anyone's using Chrome, that'll work just fine. And then you're probably already all familiar with MetaMask, um, but if you're not, that's something that you're going to want to get uh, hooked up to Chrome or whatever web browser that you're using or something like it so that you can interact with these Web3 APIs. Um, so the code that we're using today is kind of our starting point is found on GitHub. Uh, it was put up there by Thomas, who you may have heard me speaking with at the beginning of this uh, this workshop. So a lot of what I do is basically copying and pasting stuff that was written by Thomas. So I, I certainly encourage you to do the same. Um, okay, so let's get Visual Studio Code going and we can actually write some code. We'll start, stop talking. I do love to talk. 
So I'm going to go ahead and close this folder that I'm working with. And for the sake of this, I'm just going to go ahead and work right on my desktop. This is going to be very simple, not a lot, not a lot going on. So we'll just do this all on our desktop here. Um, so I'm using Visual Studio Code as both the text editor and it's, it also exposes like a, a console that you can use. Um, we are going to be working a little bit on the console or terminal, however you want to call it. Um, and it's, it's definitely something that you'll want to get familiar with. It's not too intimidating. Uh, so here using Visual Studio Code, I can open up a console and you can see that this console is like pointed right into my desktop because that's where uh, Visual Studio Code is open to. So I'm going to use NPM to install Remix D, and Remix D is going to be the thing that connects our local machine to the Remix online um, IDE. I already have it installed, uh, but you can just do this over and over again. So NPM I is short for install. G, it means global, means I want it installed everywhere so I can use this program just like any other program on my machine. And then the name of the program that I'm installing is Remix D. Everyone loves awkward silences, especially me. But they should only take another second or two. Okay, so we got Remix D installed. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start up Remix D using this command. Very, very simple. Kind of unpack it for a second. So uh, Remix D, we're telling it that we're gonna use the, the directory that we're currently in. This uh, dot stands for the current directory. And then we're telling it that we're just gonna hook it up to the, the good old fashioned, you know, standard Remix that's out there or that Ethereum makes available for everyone. So got that started up, very simple. Um, and so now we're going to take that code that Thomas made available for us, and we're just going to download it right to our desktop. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Let me make sure I'm getting the right, right code here. Ah, uh, yes. Good old Google. don't want to save it as .sol.txt. It's just going to be a .sol. It's a Solidity smart contract. So I'm going to save it like that. Go ahead and close that. And so now if I go back into Visual Studio Code, you can see that I have that here locally. It's on my machine and I can, I can make changes to it locally. Um, but what you'll also notice is that despite the fact that I talked about you know, I think Visual Studio Code is a, a nice piece of software and I like using it. It's not doing much for us in the way of this Solidity file. It's not highlighting anything. Um, and if you're a developer and you're used to working with stuff, you probably want to have some syntax highlighting and all that. So this is what Remix is going to help us with. So we've saved the code. Now let's go ahead and open up Remix. And you'll, you'll see that what we're going to do is follow the steps to connect to localhost. So it, it it's already knows that I kind of probably want to do this. So it's asking me if I want to. So I'm going to go ahead and say connect to local host. But you can see that here on the home screen, there's like this button here to connect to local host. And uh, if you're not seeing any of this, you can click on the little plug over here, the plugin manager. And the one that I'm making use of, I think, is probably this Remix D plugin. It's using it to access the local file system. So we'll go back to the file explorer over here. We can close our little home menu and you can see that we have the browser stuff, which we're not going to be using. We're going to be running everything from our local host. And one of the things we have here is a testnet consumer.sol. So let's go ahead and open that up. And I have things set to auto compile. And before we even start talking about that, let's just look and see that, wow, this looks a lot nicer. It's much easier to read this code because we have some nice syntax highlighting going on there. And in fact, telling us, hey, something is wrong. You got to fix something. So we'll move off of the file explorer and into the compilation tab and we'll see what the problem is. Uh, this contract specifies that we want to use a certain version of the Solidity compiler and that's not 
the one that we're using. So let's switch to the correct version of the Solidity compiler. And you can see that it's already kind of doing stuff for me. Remix is not a perfect tool. Um, it's certainly better than any totally online Solidity compiler integrated development environment that I have written. So you're not going to hear me say too many bad things about it. But as you can see, it you know it, it has some little bugs. Um, this this happens. I don't know why this happens, but you can kind of just ignore it. Um, I wish that that wasn't the case, but that, I'm just going to have to leave you with that. So let's switch to the deploy and run transactions tab. And you can see that it didn't work that time to compile it. So we're going to have to do it one more time. Uh, so just click compile a testnet consumer.sol. And again, um, not necessarily like the greatest feedback coming through, but if we switch back to this tab, what you'll see is that now we have some stuff here that we can work with. Um, so let's just see where we are on the, the little uh, document that I created here. So we've, uh, we navigated to Remix, we connected it to localhost, we compiled a testnet consumer, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna deploy it onto the Robson Ethereum test network. So we're, we're gonna go live. Um, first thing we want to do, we do want to use MetaMask to do this. So we're going to use injected web three and you can see I'm already connected. I got everything all set up with MetaMask. Um, and then you do want to make sure that you go down here and you're, you're using the right contract. So you can go to as testnet consumer and, and select that one. And now let's click deploy and you can see since I'm all hooked up to MetaMask, we're going to get going here. And since we're on net and for you guys, so I just up to the gas. So this is actually a good time to pause and see if anyone has any questions. Totally cool if you do not. I, I hope that that is a good sign. Um, if you don't have any questions about what I'm doing now, awesome. I'm glad that you're with me. Um, and if you know, if you have some questions about kind of like Chainlink or the hackathon or like big stuff like that, uh, just hold on to those and we'll we'll talk about those in a second. Did you get that Remix D for Visual Studio Code somewhere else? I'm not finding that in the available extensions. So it's not an extension for Visual Studio Code. I used um, NPM to install it on the command line. So I installed it globally using the dash G flag. And, and that installed it. It's, it's uh, completely independent of Visual Studio Code. I was just using the Visual Studio Code console to install it because it kind of makes everything easier for me. Thanks. So I'm just checking. You can see the contract deployment is still pending, even though I up the gas. Wouldn't be a, a live demo without, you know, a little slowness and such. Any other questions about Remix D? That was a great question. Uh, sorry, I have one question, but it is not about Remix. Uh, could you give me, please, uh, the link of this workshop document, please, in chat? Yes, um, that, that should be in the chat already. I pasted it in there. So if you go to the Zoom chat, uh, you should find it. Um, and, and if you're having a hard time finding it right now, after the workshop, I'll make sure that it's distributed widely. Um, but it looks like our contract was deployed, which is awesome. So let's go ahead and click this little arrow here and see what we got. We got all kinds of stuff. This is really cool. This is why we want to work in Remix and not in Visual Studio Code because Remix is, you know, it's provided by the Ethereum Foundation and it's really, it's designed to do this kind of stuff. So even though it has its little snags and hairy bits, um, it's, it's a pretty good tool. So. We're going to stick with that for now. 
Okay, so now we can go back to our workshop and let's see. Uh, we did deploy the contract and now we're going to use MetaMask to fund it with Link. As you are probably, or as you may be aware, Link is a, an ERC-20 token that is used not only as a means of value exchange within the, the Chainlink network, but it's also used as the means of uh, value, like message transference. It's a message passing uh, mechanism. So we need to fund our contract with Link so that it's able to, to use it to send requests and such. So here in MetaMask, I'm going to go over to the link section. Oops, I got to just use Remix to copy the, the address of my contract. I think everything's still running a little slow because, you know, I'm typing out my screen to y'all. Okay. So let's go ahead and send some link. We'll do 25, which is way more than you need to send. But that's cool. Like I said, I love spending free money. Y'all should come to New Orleans with me. Um, while we're waiting for this to happen, were you able to find the, the link for the workshop document? Yeah, Dan, one question. Uh, so, where is it connecting Remix to the local host? Yeah. Pardon me? Why Why are we connecting Remix ID to the local host? Like, uh, you connected it? Um, because, you know, presumably you guys are going to want to, uh, you know, create a project and then be able to submit it to GitHub so that you can you can submit it as part of the hackathon. And I think the best way to do that is, you know, have the code locally and push it out to GitHub. That's certainly the way that I know how to do it. Um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to share with y'all as part of this workshop. You, you definitely can just work entirely in Remix and, um, you know, maybe then copy and paste code or something locally, but, to me, this is just more of a natural flow for a developer. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because that's actually a really important question and a good question. Because I mean, that's sort of what I'm here to help people understand is like, why, why is this a good workflow for developers to engage in? Yeah, it makes sense. Otherwise, I would have to copy okay. the contract right to the local version. Yeah, exactly. And so this way, it's just kind of like we're Remix is a wonderful uh, IDE, but it's not necessarily it's not a file system, you know, and so let's allow our file system to do its file system thing. We can use familiar tools like Git to interact with our file system um, and then we can just use Remix is kind of this this piece of software that we we use as a you know a, an Ethereum IDE. So very good question. That's exactly what we're here to talk about today. So we got our contract funded with Link. Um, are there any more questions before we move on? Okay. So we're going to head over to the Chainlink docs and we're just going to copy some values from here. Okay, so what we're copying is the address of a Oracle contract and then the ID for a job. So we want to do request Ethereum price. So we're going to paste that in right there. Just got the values that we needed and now I'm going to click request Ethereum price. Gonna make it rain all over the Robson test net. Okay, so what's happening now is we have invoked this function, request Ethereum price that you see starting on line 32 right there. 
And as you can see, we're hooking in to this uh, really friendly, what I would call kind of SDK or, or client library um, that's making it very easy for you to, as the name states, build a chain link request. And so what we're doing is we are building a chain link request that's going to go out to this uh, URL that we've specified here. And it's gonna traverse the JSON path. And in this case, it's a very, very simple path. It, we're just gonna get the USD value. And then we're gonna take whatever value we find there and we're gonna multiply it times 100. So, oopsie. Um, before we move any farther, let's just look and let's see exactly what we're getting there. So just, oh, that's right, thank you. Okay, just in our browser, we're gonna go there. And you can see it's very simple. This is the Ethereum to USD exchange rate. So we're, we're in that path, we're getting USD here. We're gonna take this value and we're gonna multiply it by 100. Um, and then you can also see that when we created this request, we specified what's called a callback. So this is gonna be the method that is invoked when the Chainlink Oracle responds to this request that it has received. It's gonna, it's gonna come back onto the Ethereum blockchain and it's gonna make sure that this fulfill Ethereum price method gets evoked. So now we can go down here to fulfill Ethereum price and you can see again that Remix is making this all really simple for us. When I click fulfill Ethereum price up here, it highlights it for me down here. And so then when we look at fulfill Ethereum price, we can see what's happening is that we're gonna um, first emit this price fulfilled event, and then we're going to take the value that we received from the Chainlink Oracle, and we're gonna use it to update this state variable that we're maintaining here, current price. So let's see if all that happened. It did, and at that, it's like the same value. So that's really cool because what happened there is we didn't just go out to that endpoint in our browser. We, from the Ethereum blockchain, requested for the Chainlink Oracle to go out to that endpoint for us, do some processing of the results that it received, and then return that value back into our contract so that we can do really cool, exciting stuff with it. So that is basically it. That's the demo. Um, now, what I have here is this little placeholder for like rocket ship. Like this is where you guys come in. Um, I'm not particularly creative <laughs> about this kind of stuff, uh, but what I can do is I can help you guys understand how to use Chainlink so that you can be creative. And like, we're so excited to see the things that you submit and, and all that kind of stuff. So does anyone, a, have any questions about what we just did? And B, would anyone like to maybe suggest some changes that we could make to this contract, maybe some additions that we could make to this contract to do something else? Are you inspired or curious to try anything? Hi, uh, can you show me uh, like how can we connect external adapters and get data through them in our smart contract? Yes, that is a really good question. Unfortunately, it's totally out of the scope of this workshop. I'm not at all prepared to do that. And I wouldn't want to start down a path of something that I'm not going to be able to explain clearly. Um, this is a question that I anticipated. And so I I make like I make a commitment to you that I will probably end up doing and make a commitment that I will probably I'm going to try my my very, very best to do another workshop specifically related to external adapters. And in the meantime, I will be available in the hackathon channels or in our discord channels um, to answer any questions that you may have. It's very, very simple. I love that you're already thinking about that, but it's just kind of out of the scope of this particular workshop. Um, for people who don't necessarily know what an external adapter is, that's uh, a kind of standalone 
piece of code that you deploy out to anywhere that you want. It just needs to be running somewhere. You know, a lot of people use AWS. You could use Heroku. You could do anywhere that you want to host it. Um, and it's used to basically like extend the functionalities of the Chainlink node. So whereas we were making use of some, you know, relatively straightforward built-in functionalities to kind of uh, get a value from a HTTP endpoint and, and stuff like that, you can use a adapter to really kind of do anything you want. And so recently I wrote an adapter that uses a gRPC API just as like, you know, something fun because I wanted to see what that was like. Um, but I would hope and think that a lot of you who are who are making some hackathon projects are definitely going to be writing some external adapters. So very, very good question. Hey Dan. Yep. Hey Dan, I was I was able to uh, uh, install the package and then run the command line of the remix uh, D, and then I went into uh, code, but I don't see the extension added there to the left, so I might have missed just one step. Could you do that one more time? Is, can you just un uninstall that um, the extension and then show me? Are where you talking to... about when you when you when you uh, connected to Remix? You didn't see a an option to connect to localhost. Yeah, it, it, uh, a message came up um, that said that I was connected to the local host, um, but I don't see where I can actually get that extension functioning within code. So I didn't, did I didn't you... see that message within code. That message was like a pop-up on my screen. So hmm. which me which message is that? very similar to the one that you have uh, on your warnings down there, but mine was in a pop-up. So okay, I, I'll work with it. I, I don't need you to, to, to focus on, on my question particularly, unless you just want to run the demo from the beginning again, unless other people. Um, let's, let me see. You went real fast trying to follow along. Okay. Let me just see. I also had a problem seeing that syntax highlighter in Visual Studio Code, which I think is probably the same thing he's talking about. Yeah, I've got all kinds of other extensions. So there is no syntax highlighting in Visual. Yeah, I've got all kinds of. What's that? I have all kinds of other extensions to get my syntax highlighting, um, so I could get it mm -hmm. um, highlighted the right way using another extension. I just don't see where to get the actual um, the Remix D installed into my code i usually just use remix so you so remix d is not installed into code whatsoever right there i there are no ex visual studio code extensions as part of this workshop if, if you have time and nobody's in objection can, can you just go back to the mm -hmm. beginning and run that first three minutes or five minutes when you just get that package over into sure. code okay so can you see like a fresh um, terminal right now on my screen where it just says desktop? Oh, I see you're running it all with encode. Okay, I was just using um, bash. Okay, so I should probably be doing it with encode. Okay, yeah. It, I it really that. doesn't, it really doesn't matter. It, okay. I'm just using, it's, it's just a terminal, just a console. And, and it's one of the, it's a feature that Visual Studio Code exposes that it has like an integrated terminal. Got it. So that's where I'm running these commands right now. But if you feel more comfortable using just a regular old bash shell, that works fine too. No, no, I, so I the, think you're doing the right thing. Just, away, run, yeah, just, just run it from here and, and I think I'll be okay. able to see what step I'm in. But the main takeaway that I really want to make sure that people are getting is that this is not a Visual Studio Code extension. I am just, I am using Visual Studio Code as two things, a text editor, and really, I'm not even using it as that. It's more just a file explorer and and a, a integrated console. But there's oh, no, no Visual Studio it. Code extension. No, I love it that you were able to run your commands on the left-hand side like that. It's beautiful. Yes. So going back to the workshop in my browser, I'm just going to copy the command to, to um, install Remix D. And as I said, I already have it installed, but you can do this as many times as you want. So the command that we're using is npm, the node package manager. I stands for install 
G means that we're going to install it globally. So it's going to be available as like a, a, an application on the system as opposed sure. to a dependency of a particular project. Um, don't worry too much about that. Totally out of the scope of this. We're just using NPM to install an application, basically. That application's name is Remix D. And if you're kind of wondering, like, as much as I would love to tell you that they named Remix D after me for Remix Dan, um, they did not. Uh, the D stands for daemon or demon or something. And, and it just a uh, program that's running on your machine that's kind of listening for changes. And then, uh, you know, if something happens, it, it does, it responds to that. So in this case, it's listening to your local file system and then piping that that information out to Remix. So got Remix D installed. Is everyone with me? Yeah, the, the, yeah, the, I'm, I'm all good with all this. It was just that last okay. step about getting it to show up in the left hand and side. So then I'm going to run this command, which is going to start Remix D. Um, the S stands for the source of, of the, you know, the source directory that I'm using to send over to Remix. And so when I say the dot, that just means the current directory. And as you can see, I'm currently in the desktop directory, because as I said, that's the directory that I'm using as my working directory for this particular workshop. And then the Remix IDE flag here tells Remix that I want to it tells Remix D that I want to connect to this instance of the Remix IDE. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So now you see that what happens here is that I can't run it because I already have Remix D running somewhere else. So let's just go ahead. I'm a little bit worried about what's going to happen here. Let's, let's, so I just, I stopped Remix D in the original terminal that I had it started. So yeah, I think I that go, this is what happened to me. So, yeah. Okay. I, I, so I now if I go somehow. back over here um, and I look in my Explorer, you'll notice that localhost disappeared because I had I stopped Remix D. So let's go back over here and we'll use the same command to start Remix D. And now I have Remix D started and I clicked on this uh, Ethereum icon here to go to the home. And do you see this, this button where it says connect to local host? Yeah, th this is the step that, that, that messed me up because I had it running somewhere else. I already had Remix in okay. my browser. So I stepped on myself. So sorry yeah, if no I wasted anybody's time. No, that, that's not a waste at all. That's exactly what we're here to do. Um, so let's just make sure that this is working because it actually, I wasn't having any luck connecting it. Okay. So, and this is what I was worried about. So what I'm going to do, and this is just a, something good to know about Remix. Um, I don't want to have to like go through the process of compiling the smart contract again and, and deploying it out to the blockchain again. So just like I got the smart contracts address so that I could send it some link before I'm going to reload remix here because it's being a little bit funny. Like I said, it's not without its little rough edges. And the reason that we're having this workshop here today is so that you are prepared to deal with all those rough edges. So okay, we're going to deal so with Dan, them right Basically, now. if if we don't even want to use code, we can just go to the remix IDE in a browser and do this entire demo there. You could, but we haven't gotten to the last part of the demo yet, which is where okay. we're going to push our code out to GitHub. And as far as I know, that's going to be the way that you're going to want to submit your code for the hackathon. So therein lies the rub. Um, so that's, that's kind of a big reason why we're doing this all locally. And that's one of the things that personally is not my, you know, if you're going to be coming at this exercise as kind of like, okay, I want to take this as a serious developer exercise. I would encourage you to work locally. Don't don't work. Don't have all your work in the the web browser. 
you're going to want to have your code locally so we can so you can use tools on it just like we're using git you may have other tools that you want to run on the, these files on your local file system that you can't run if you just have them locally um so just for lots of reasons try to get comfortable having the code locally and, and that's why i'm i know it may seem like kind of this weird unnecessary extra step but in the long run i think it's going to create if not a workflow, like at the very least a mindset that you're going to want to, to move point. forward with. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to reload Remix because I'm not able to get it connected to our to the local file system for some reason. And I don't really want to waste a lot of time trying to solve that problem. But before I do that, I want to make sure that I'm able to get back to the the contract that I have deployed. So I'm going to copy its address to my clipboard, and reload Remix. It's asking me like, hey, changes may not be saved, but that's cool. That's what we're prepared for. So reloaded it, and now you can see that it's asking me, do you want to connect to localhost? And just for the heck of it, let's click cancel because I'm feeling adventurous and I want to see if it works um, in case you do the same thing. So now I'm going to come down here and I'm going to click connect to local host and things look like they're working again. Dan, just real so quick, click connect. real quick, what's that fourth icon mm -hmm. on the left-hand side? The one with the Ethereum logo and the little sort of like right, I don't know, like, yeah, yeah. What, what extension is that? No, it's not an extension. Okay, well, this is part, this is part of the Remix IDE. Got it. It's one of the, Thanks. yep, yep. Um, so... You see now we're we're back connected. Um, let's see, things didn't compile, so let's let's compile them. Uh, it doesn't know what to compile, so we're going to go back to a testnet consumer and actually, yep, it's going to go ahead and start compiling it on its own. Yep, don't know why that happens. Got to file a bug with uh, with Remix. But like I said, all in all, this is a, a fabulous tool, much better than anything I have written. So not going to complain about these little rough edges. So now uh, we're back on the deploy and run transactions tab here in Remix. Uh, we want to make sure that we're switched back to injected Web3. We're going to go back to a testnet consumer here. This is the contract that we want to interact with. To be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure what all of these are. I think they're I think they're pulled in by these dependencies right here, um, and it, it is a little bit confusing. Uh, I've gotten tripped up myself a few times because I, I forgot to come down here and click this one. So don't forget to click that. Um, and we don't want to deploy it. That's going to take more time and cost more gas and all that. We already have it deployed. And we know where we have it deployed. We, we got that address earlier. So now I can see I already have that deployed. And when I click current price, that value is already populated because we've already interacted with the smart contract to, to do that. Any other questions about that? Uh, hey, Dan. Uh, where did yeah. we spend the link? Here. Like we, I, if I remember correctly, you added 25 link to your wallet. Right? Where did we use it? Where did you use it? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like where, where did the link come in in this process? Uh, exactly. Like, did you spend the link? Yeah. So. Yeah. So when when we send this request from the the um our smart contract that's where the the link is going to come in the, the all of the these values that we're bundling up into our request they will get put into the link token and sent over to the oracle contract and um this is where you know i don't have a ton of information on the details of that so i know that there are, are potentially and hopefully other people from the Chainlink team on this call. And I'm always happy to, um, you know, 
learn learn from them as well. But that's kind of the gist of it. Yeah. If you anyone are... wants to chime in with some additional info, please do. Yeah, uh, I can provide more info there. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Thomas. Okay. Yep. So love it. Yeah, that that ch send chain link request to method. I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but that's basically where within that method, we are performing the link tokens transfer and call functionality from this contract, which is a testnet consumer. And then we're interacting with the link token contract. Uh, it's not gonna be in the body of this. It's actually gonna be in a uh, inherited contract. Um, but it's basically where we're gonna interact with the link token contract to call transfer and call the and basically we can look at these these values here to know exactly what we're doing so the underscore oracle that's the address that we're going to send the request to the rec is the body of the data that we're sending and then the oracle payment is the amount so it's kind of in a different order than transfer and call signature but it's essentially the same thing. So we have sender, amount, and data. And that's the three required parameters for transfer and call. But that's where that link token actually comes into use is this contract is funded with link and then we do transfer and call from this contract to the Oracle contract. Okay, so- Does that answer your question? Yeah, so I mean, does the link like the, how much link we spend depend on the API that we are calling, or, or is it independent of any API? We have? It depends on what the so node. The operator amount of links that's required to to execute the request depends on the node operator that you've selected. They set the prices for the various data providers that they expose. So okay. in this case, uh we are using a node that is operated by Chainlink. So I can assure you we're providing you with the best value. Awesome, great, thanks. Hey, yep. hey if we wanted to play around with this, uh, this Solidity file right here, um, what would be the uh, area that we would want to play around with to test some different um, Oracle ideas? Would it be just I right, love it. At, right, right in the middle? Let's of that do screen? it right now. That's what what that's what we're here to do. What what kind of ideas do you have? Oh, well, just I guess we could just run a weather one. Weather one's real simple because you already have a bunch of providers. Weather. Yep. Okay. Very good idea. I'm going to pull it back a little bit um, because I want to make sure that I don't bite off more than I can chew. Um, we do have some. Uh, adapters out there on testnet with weather data and stuff like that. Um, so what I'm going to do just to showcase at a very basic level how you can make some changes to this contract, start playing around. Um, right now, request Ethereum price is getting the, the price in, in USD, which is cool. But I just got back from Osaka. That's where DevCon was. It was a really cool trip. So I'm feeling very inspired by Japan. Um, and so I think I actually want to know what the Ethereum price is in Japanese yen. Um, so let's go ahead and implement that. So first of all, let's see if we're going to be able to get that data. Does it exist out there? And I hope you can tell that these are... Uh, rhetorical questions that I am asking myself. So this is the USD one. Let's see if there's one for Japanese yen. Oh, surprise, surprise, there is. Okay, great. So we know that that data exists out there. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, now, if you recall, oh, wait, 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 sorry. I, I don't want to um, walk all over the, the functionality that already exists, I want to create new functionality. So I'm just going to copy this method. And when I do so, you'll probably notice that Remix starts to complain because I, I have the same method twice. So we'll change that to JPY because that's what we're going to get. And then we'll come over here and this is where we'll do JPY. And then remember we talked about the fact that in the request we're telling it 
where to traverse into to get the value. And so obviously in this message that we're receiving, there is no USD value. We wanna make sure that we change that to JPY. And this in fact is something that I tripped up on when I was doing this beforehand and preparing. So make sure you don't make the same mistake as me. Okay, so let's see. The other thing that we wanna make sure of is that we don't probably wanna use the same callback function. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and use a different callback function. So we're gonna do kind of the same thing that we did here. We're just going to copy that. And again, gonna complain. Uh, so we're gonna add a little JPY to the end. And we're just going to go through and kind of um, do every, you know, do the same for everything that exists for this USD. We're going to create a JPY version of it. So can change this to JPY, and we're going to want to maintain a current price in yen, so we'll add that there. So in our callback function, we have a new name, we have a new callback function. We're gonna emit this new uh, event that we created and we wanna update the new state variable that we created with the price that the, the Oracle is going to return. And so now in our request Ethereum price JPY method, we want to make sure that we're hooked up to the correct uh, callback method. So let's just double check what we did here. We only needed to change the callback here. We changed the URL that we're using. We changed the path. So I think that looks pretty good. Does anyone have any questions about what I did? did? Does anyone spot anything that I did wrong? Okay, cool. So everything should be compiling dynamically. So what we're gonna do, oops, sorry, everything's running a little slow. We're going to deploy A new version of this version that we just again this is there's just going to be some awkward silence here while we wait for these to confirm so if you have any questions about what I just did why I changed some things but not others this is your chance to ask those questions uh, if we want to pass parameters in post request to some, can we do post request through uh, chain link? I uh, yes, I believe that you can. Uh, Thomas, can you add a little bit more color to that? I think you probably have more knowledge there than I yeah. do. Yeah, you'll need to use the job ID that's associated to the HTTP post uh, adapter. Okay, and then if you want to pass parameters uh, to the post request. Uh, do we do request dot add the name of parameter or yep. like what this? Yeah, I'm ninety percent sure it's it's that simple. Yeah. Oh, yep. Okay. And it'll add it as data. And if we have like some big JSON body, how um, is there any like parse method or like do we paste it all in request dot param? No. So, so yeah. we have parsing adapters. So like you see on this request like even on this contract here where we have rec.add path jpy mm -hmm. that's just where you would you would provide it with the path that you want you want parsed from that response so if you have a really long path like that you send uh, back. uh i mean if if i'm passing uh, posting something to some uh, specific uh, url i want to uh, post my data which is in like uh, complex json format how am i supposed to do that I'd need more information. What is a complex JSON format, and why are you storing like if, all of this if, uh, on chain? If it's long, if uh, okay, so if if, if it's uh, 
if it's some for pay, some payment provider and I need to post data to some specific URL, uh, should I just add like request or add each parameter name uh, separately or so, I can add like request or add body and then the whole body of it. Hold on, just to back up here, you said to a payments API. So uh -huh. most likely you're going to have some kind of API key associated with uh -huh. talking to that API, right? Yeah. So most likely you're going to want to use an external adapter. You're not going to oh. want to just pass in that API key on chain because then everyone will be able to see it. Yeah. So yeah, okay. you can That's you can look at the PayPal adapter that we that we built as an example, just because that's another payments API. But yeah, I was trying. Yeah, I was trying to use that PayPal adapter, but I was confused between how how I uh, how would I integrate it with the request? What would be the job ID there? Like, how am I supposed? Because uh, I was running it locally on Docker. Yeah. So on my you're, system. you're looking at a few different. Okay, so I want to I want to make sure that we're able to get through this workshop. Um, again. External adapters are key to extending Chainlink's functionality, and I absolutely expected that they were going to come up as a very important topic of this workshop, and I'm so glad that they did. I think that lots of you are going to be writing external adapters for the hackathon. I hope that you come to agree with me that they are so, so easy to write. You can write them in any language that you want. Um, there's marketplaces out there existing of adapters that Chainlink has nothing to do with other than, you know, they're, they're meant to run on the Chainlink software. Um, but I hope and expect that after this hackathon, there will be a lot more adapters out there on these marketplaces that you guys created as part of your, your hackathon entry. So there's going to be a lot more information about adapters coming through as part of this hackathon in our Discord channels. There'll be more workshops, um, but got about eight more minutes to make it through this workshop. So I do okay. want to make sure that I get all the way through to show you how to put things on. Hey, Dan, are those adapters so at all? We, uh, uh, part of this solidity contract right here, or is it completely a different topic? This has, we're not using any external okay, adapters you. as part of this workshop. This is all using built in chain link capabilities. Thank you. So you can see here that we now have uh, two deployed contracts. We have the one that we did before where I copied the address and pasted it in, uh, but then this is the new one that we just deployed. And so if we go down, whoa you can see that it has like this new state variable current price jpy um which this one does not have um now one thing i want to mention before i i click anything here is that i'm going to go a little bit fast when i uh request the price and then go to click the current price jpy because what i want you to see is that initially it's going to be zero i I do tend to talk a lot, as you've probably noticed, and so I kind of talked over that for the last time, but I want to make sure you see it this time. So what I'm going to do is just kind of demonstrate it to you, and then we'll, we'll circle back, and we'll, we'll just make sure that everyone understands why exactly that happened. So we don't need to change anything in the parameters when we're invoking our, our new uh, function here on our smart contract. So let's just make sure request Ethereum price JPY. We're going to paste that in there. Oh, I forgot to fund this contract with Link. It's a new contract that I deployed out there. Didn't fund it with Link, so have to do that. That is a super common error. Mistake, oversight, whatever you want to call it. There is a, a faucet out there, which I'm sure most of you are already familiar with, but uh, there's a link faucet out there for you to use. And just to show you that 25 is like way more link than you need to fund it with, we're just gonna do one this time. <clears throat> so this is a, a good opportunity. I know I kind of mentioned that I was about to do something quickly, um, does anyone have any questions before before I do that? Well, just a comment. This is great so far. It's it's got all the elements 
systems that we need to start working. Awesome. That's the goal. Glad to hear it. My whole like, you know, I want I want you to see that Chainlink is super duper powerful. Um, but I hope that you see that once you know you kind of get over this learning curve, which really is is not even that steep. Um, it's it, kind of just going to disappear into the yeah, background damn, like do, any other do tool. As many of these as you can. To, you know these little workshops as, as many as they'll allow you to do. Oh yeah, I mean. They, they have to keep me from talking. Okay, so that went through. Our contract is funded with Link. Now we're gonna go ahead and request. So, okay, that worked, but you can see even, even after it, the, you know, the, the request was confirmed and everything, I clicked current price JPY and it's still showing zero. And I know I have been like frustrated by this a couple of times. I think I was probably like bugging Thomas, even on Slack, like Thomas, why is it still showing zero? The, you know, it was confirmed. Um, it's just because the chain link node is waiting to, you know, respond. It, it's uh, making the, the request in the background. It's waiting for some blocks to process. Um, and then it's gonna call back into our, um, into our callback method there and, and update the current price JPY with uh, the value that we got back. At least that's the... Uh, Okay, because I'm not quite sure what's going on and I don't want to waste time on this, let's assume that everything worked perfectly. That's uh, always a good thing to do. And let's just go ahead and finish up with the, the Git stuff because that's the, the important part of hey, the, the last part. What's up? Real quick, check, use mm -hmm. Explorer to see, to see the status. Oh, see, it updated. Sometimes you just gotta wait a, a, a couple minutes. Um, but yes, uh, Thomas is absolutely correct. Actually, Thomas like went on this like amazing journey through the the Explorer the other day, and it was like so amazing for me to see how he was able to use that information to debug a problem. I am nowhere near there yet, um, but. There is an explorer that you can use out there to kind of look at the blockchain and the transactions and everything. And it's a great way to debug stuff. Um, do you want to make sure that we finish the Git piece for now, though? Um, so again, uh, kind of getting Git installed is out of scope of this workshop. I'm going to assume, assume you have it already installed. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and kill Remix D. We're just back at the um, back at the command line here. I'm going to create a new Git repository, just like it said. Now I'm going to use Git to quote unquote stage that file that I created. This is all just kind of Git terminology, nothing super fancy going on. Now I'm going to commit it. This is just how Git, you know, helps you track the changes that you're making. So now we're going to head on over to GitHub, and I'm going to create a new repository. And I think I already suggested that you name it Chainlink Remix Workshop. As I said, I'm not creative. That's what I like you guys to do. So created this repository, and now you can see use the commands provided by GitHub to push an existing repository from the command line. So I'm just going to copy this value over here, go back to um, Visual Studio Code. It executed the first command, and now the second command is what's gonna push it out there. And now I go back to GitHub, 
and look at that. Is this the world's first workshop that ended like exactly on time? I literally can't even believe it. Um, are there any other questions? Like I'm happy to go over time. I definitely don't have anything to do. What's, what's that? What's <laughs> um, that? What's the chore? Uh, chore proj colon in it. Oh, good question. That's just um, so if you, if and when you start working more closely with Git, you are going to want to have uh, different conventions that you use that that makes things easier for yourself. Um, you know, one way to think about things is that as computer people, we like to solve problems with computers um, and computers aren't very good at processing unstructured information so any chance that you have to add structure to your workflows as a computer programmer uh, you're creating opportunities to you know create tooling around those workflows and so this is a fairly common paradigm or whatever you want to call it for structuring your git commit messages um and okay. so it's one that i use uh, hi uh, will you be doing a workshop related to external adapters soon yes i think that i need to <laughs> and i I'm, I'm happy to do so it's going to be a you know if you guys enjoyed this workshop i think it'll be a really really fun follow-up. It's going to take me a couple days to kind of figure out the best way to, um, you know, fit everything into the proper amount of time. Um, but in the meantime, I think you'll see that if you understood what we're doing in this workshop, it shouldn't take you very long to get started with external adapters. They're, they're not, you know, we're not changing the world with the external adapters. We're just changing the world one external adapter at a time, I guess is what I should say. Uh, sure, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Like I said, I'm not, not in any rush to get off the, the line here. I don't, I don't know if the organizers are, but um, I'm certainly happy to stick around until everyone's questions are answered. Hey Dan, uh, you specified a callback, right? When we uh, it, when we call an API and it returns the successful data, then you call, uh, then you use the callback function, right? So what if uh, uh, like it doesn't follow through, right? I mean, if the API is not working or if it's broken, like, can we ha handle the error here, or how does that work? Or do we assume it's going to be successful? Every um. Time? I think that it is possible for like an error to occur. Like, let's say that you've created an external adapter um, and maybe you, you made a little error when you were programming the external adapter. It, it definitely happens to me, it happens to the best of us. And so it is entirely possible that uh, for one reason or another, the data isn't returned. Uh, let's imagine that the, you know, we were reaching out to that endpoint to get the Ethereum to yen exchange rate. That that endpoint is maintained by someone. If that endpoint were to go down, obviously we wouldn't be able to get that information back to us. Um, so just like any developer of any kind of, of application, be it blockchain or otherwise, you're, you need to be prepared for what's gonna happen if some external dependency isn't there to, to return the value that you need it to or expect it to. Um, so the, the thing about Chainlink that is really special is that we provide these decentralized Oracle cap capabilities so that you can query a number of Oracles, query a number of different data providers so that you, you shrink this possibility that that you won't receive a response. Thomas, do you have any color to add to that answer, yeah. or does you know does that answer the, the question yeah, specifically from as a smart contract developer? Like if if your callback function isn't called within five minutes, you can use that cancel request method to receive the link that you use to fund that request back. Oh, so we can revert the transaction, basically. 
technically it's not reverting a transaction. It's built into the protocol where if the node doesn't respond within five minutes, you can simply receive that link that you sent back. But it's not, I, I just, I don't want to use the term reverting a transaction because there's no, you're, you're not rolling back the blockchain here. You're yeah, just okay. following along the protocol. Okay, I was unaware of the fact that you have different uh, sources of API. So I think that, that answered my question. Yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to add, like, the workshop is really amazing. Thanks a lot. Oh, great. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I, the questions are great. I mean, the, I can tell that you guys are, like, thinking about these things and interested and, like, making me so excited for, for your hackathon submissions. Um, are there any other questions that people have? Okay. Well, um, sorry, I just saw that someone unmuted themselves. Any? Yeah, that was me, uh, Justin from Cornelius. I'm just going to say, Dan, thank you so sorry. much for this awesome presentation. This was really, really awesome. Uh, and um, for the audience out there, uh, where can people find out more about Chainlink and get involved with the hackathon? So let me, okay. I am going to post in our so this is more information about the hackathon, and you can also find that from the sign up page, which is probably the really important one. I just dropped that oh, in there. there yeah. Awesome, awesome. Cool. And Read I'm just out. wanting to what's that? Tweet it out too. We'll try to forward it. Yeah. Out oh yeah. We've been we've been tweeting like crazy. I'm like, as someone who is acutely aware of the fact that I talk too much, I'm like, don't want to tweet too much either. Um, but we'll we'll make sure. You know, we're gonna get I a, think we're gonna get a shush. Like, we're gonna get a shush back for you. <laughs> I need it. I need it. Thanks for um, doing this, Thomas. Thanks for your input too. Yep. Yes. Thank you very much, Thomas. No problem. And yeah, you guys feel free to just kind of file out. If you guys don't have any more time, I'll wait until, you know, no one else is around just to make sure that there aren't any questions. But I, I don't have anything else to say. I'm just here to answer, answer questions now. Thank you very much for, for joining everyone. It was a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoyed it too. Thanks. Thanks a lot. See you, Dan. I got to drop. I got another call. All right. Later, Thomas. Thanks. It doesn't look like there are any other questions out there. I'm going to end the meeting uh, and then I'll uh, work on getting the video uh, up on our YouTube page so we can share this with people that weren't able to make it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone.